My name is Mike Bithell and I'm an indie game developer. So let's start by talking a little about uh, Reboot here in Croatia. You've been coming for three years. How have you seen this show evolve? So, I mean, it keeps getting bigger. That's the first thing to say. Uh, the venue, they've tweaked a couple of times. But yeah, it's it still feels like this very intimate, kind of cool uh, game developers conference where everyone's kind of, everyone knows each other. There's a lot of friendliness. There's a lot of uh, people I see here every year. It's, it's a nice kind of family atmosphere almost. It's good. Talk a little about uh, your talk this year and what your focus was. So one thing with my talks is that uh, they're often attended by indies or people who are just starting out. Uh, and so what I try and do uh, this event is I'll give kind of introductions to like certain ways of thinking rather than trying to do the kind of classic thing of why my game did very, very well. And if you just do everything I did, everything will be fine kind of thing. It's a bit of a boring talk. Um, I try and do uh, tips and, 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 and about process and thinking. So this year it was, I did one on uh, how we choose what we're making, how we decide on a project we want to create, uh, what the thinking is behind those decisions, and kind of trying to explain to people how to go through that process and make better choices in terms of the games they decide to make. So it, it seems to have gone down well. What do you feel some of the keys are to the success you've had with your games? Um, luck is the predominant and overwhelming factor. Um, no, I think I've, I think I've, I've been lucky enough uh, to be at a point in my career at a moment in time where Indy was doing very well. Um, Thomas Was Alone obviously kind of blew up for me. Uh, and since then, I've kind of been making other stuff and trying to expand on that on that first initial success. And that seems to have balanced out quite well and, and, and gone. But it, it is still predominantly luck. I mean, that's the, that's the major factor in all of this, I think. What impact has the current retro phase played in having a text-based game succeed <laughs> I, I think I think it's I think it's if nothing else I think players are getting more open to weird experiences I think players and, and players actually want those kind of innovative different takes on games or yes kind of more retro takes but kind of updated to the modern day I think subsurface circular su uh, success is like a mix of people loving those sort of text adventure games of the past but also liking those modern game design sensibilities there's a lot of kind of Ubisoft kind of game design communication stuff in there that I think wasn't present in those older games and, and players may not even be aware that it's got that layer on it uh, but it kind of makes that more accessible while also keeping a, a, all that kind of original weirdness of the text adventure genre so I think we we had something special there. I don't think a, a, a big AAA publisher would ever greenlight a, a text-based game in this day and age but what kind of freedom do you have on the indie side of things? Well, I mean, we very nearly didn't greenlight this game. So Subsurface Circular, I did a deal with my business partner, um, like a handshake deal between the two of us that I, you know, I would have a little bit of budget to try and make this. Um, but until about a month before Subsurface Circular came out, I wasn't sure if I was going to can it or not. Like, it was a weird thing, and we knew that going in. I think that's the great thing. The great thing about the position I'm in is that we have a little bit of cash that we can experiment with and, and see what happens. And in some service circulars case, it went very well and it's obviously done well for us, but um, there's also lots of things we could have made that wouldn't have gone well, you know, and it's it's kind of... So I think that's the thing is ultimately the freedom. I, you know, for those smaller projects, I don't need to wait for someone else to greenlight them. I can kind of follow an idea that I think is interesting. Um, and all I have to do is convince my team. Uh, and then and if my team says it's terrible, then I probably won't make it. That won't work out. Um, and then with bigger projects, obviously, yeah, you have those other people at the round the table, which, which brings with it its own awesomeness because those people can bring insight or perspectives that you don't have. But yeah, for that kind of weirder game, it's, it's great to have the freedom to make little things that interest me. We've seen on the more AAA side, everyone doing Battle Royale games these days. Uh, given the success you guys have had with text-based, do you feel like there might be a, a trendsetter there? Like a text-based uh, Battle Royale? No, no, but a, trend, a trendsetter <laughs> in terms of more text-based games. Not um, a Battle Royale text-based game. I certainly talk to other developers who've been making similar things or want to make similar things, um, who've said that like it's it seems to have it's proven that there's an audience there for it. So I don't think it's a case of anyone kind of necessarily copying it, but I think there will be people who are already making cool stuff in that genre that maybe can appeal to the same audience. Um, there's a lot of, I've seen a lot of like user reviews of the game where it is like, oh, I hate text adventures, but this one seemed cool, or this is my first text adventure. And that's exciting because that, I like that that implies that maybe they're gonna go and check out some other stuff. And there is, there is a lot of interesting work in the genre. There's lots of great interactive fiction that's been being made for so I can't claim any ownership of the idea. Um, 
and I yeah, if it if it if it brings a few of that broader audience to the genre in general, that's gonna be amazing. When you travel and go to places like Croatia, uh, other develop other developer conferences, you get to see the indies from all over the world. How does that type of thing influence you when you're thinking about what you're going to do next? I mean, it's good for me. It's it's about awareness, it's about knowing kind of what the international scene is like. I think it's very easy. Uh, especially like on Twitter, to really focus on the, uh, the British and American, the English speaking voices basically. Uh, so coming to events like this and meeting the local indies, meeting uh, people from all over who are making these great games, yeah, it gives me, uh, it gives me an awareness of what's going on, it gives me an awareness uh, which I guess doesn't so much inform the games as the way I talk about the games and the way I try and help people. I think that's the main thing, is, is identifying where, where people are struggling, where the challenges are right now, and for me as well, Obviously, I'm at a point where I've had some successes, so um, my experience as an indie is very different to someone who's just starting out. So having conversations with people who are, you know, struggling to make their first game and around their day job and are just kind of making their first thing, talking to that person and seeing what it's like in 2018 to be that person, as opposed to what it was like in 2012 to be that person, um, is fascinating. So I wouldn't say it informs the games, but it definitely informs how I want to try and help people and, and be supportive of the community. When you look at the overall gaming landscape, you're seeing fewer and fewer of the AAAs being made to begin with, but a plethora of indies. How do you see indies moving forward, evolving? Um, I think it's there's a there's a you know a degree of growth. If you look at um, Nina's here from Ninja Theory and that that kind of what they've done in terms of like growing essentially into a, a mini a mini AAA of their own with Hellblade, that's incredible. Um, that growth can happen, and that's and and it seems to happen quite a bit. So I think I think. I think indies are an excellent training ground. I think some indies, like myself, stay quite small, but then others will, will grow up and, and fill those gaps. So I see it all as interconnected. There's also a great deal of people in AAA who started in indie, or people in AAA who then become indie. I don't see them necessarily as separate industries. I think everything feeds into each other. It's really interesting that um, AAA often is the is the is the hub around which a group of indie developers forms. You know, if you look at any city where a big game is being made, that's also a city where people will have left that studio or been laid off or the studio's gone uh, wrong or whatever, and you will have these clusters of indies around where that studio is. So I think it all feeds back into itself and it's all helpful to each other. So. Yeah, I think it'll just continue to cycle around. What 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 I'm waiting for, what I think is going to be really interesting, is if we ever get a situation where an indie um, moves directly from indie into AAA direction. You know, I don't think it's something I can necessarily do. I don't think I'm ready for it at all. But you, in the film industry, for example, you see uh, someone who makes a couple of really interesting indie films then being put at the helm of a big blockbuster movie, right? And we don't get that in games. And there's a lot of logistical reasons for that because there's a lot of complexities to building AAA games, of course, that indie isn't prepared for. Um, but I would love to see that in the future. I'd love to see even more creative cross-pollination because I think there's amazing ideas on both sides.